Today's New Testament lesson is from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Here ends the word. Amen. Before I read our passage from Isaiah this morning, I want to put it in a little bit of context for you. So the chapter, chapter 40, starts what scholars commonly call Second Isaiah. And it marks a turn in the book of Isaiah from admonishing Israel for her sins and calling for repentance to uh, hope, hope in salvation and redemption from the trials and sufferings of exile. Historically, the book of Isaiah spans a long period of time during which the Israelites are conquered by foreign powers and exiled and eventually see the hope of returning home. As chapter 40 begins, there is just a glimmer of hope in that the Persian Empire is taking over Babylon. And it seems like because of this change in oppressor, there might be a possibility of returning to the homeland. The passage depicts a heavenly scene where there's different heavenly voices crying out. It is a scene that indicates that all these political developments that are happening in the lives of the people are closely connected to God. The decree from the heavens is to create a pathway a highway in the wilderness towards home. And so salvation is not coming from King Cyrus of Persia, but from God. Let us hear these words from Isaiah this morning. Comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid. She has, received, she has received from the Lord's hands double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low, and the uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out, and I say, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers. The flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers. The flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. 
Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good news, lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord comes with might and sets his arm rules before him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. The words that open this reading from Isaiah, comfort, sound different on my ears in English than what I learned about the Hebrew words this week. To me, the word comfort means something akin to coziness, hot cocoa, a fire in the fireplace, gentle snow falling outside, a good book. That's comfort. But there is nothing cozy about the proclamation from Isaiah this morning. God's people are in a situation of suffering and oppression. They've experienced tremendous upheaval, which has affected generations of their people. The trauma of war and forced relocation have taken their toll. Yet there is good news proclaimed. And the good news is that with God's help, the exiles may travel on a highway in the wilderness, through the desert, from exile back to home. This is a comfort that comes not from coziness, but out of hope in the promise of restoration. But it is a promise that cannot be realized without risk, without effort, and without courage, for the journey will not be easy. In fact, I learned this week that that word comfort in the Hebrew is not so much comfort as a word that indicates reversal. So I have found Hebrew to be a very visual language. Rather than giving specific definitions for the word, it's almost easier to uh, imagine an image to understand what the word means. So in this word, it's like turning from wherever you are to a new place. In this case, the Israelites are in deep suffering. And so an act of turning is turning towards the promise of peace, of wholeness, and restoration. Here, God calls for a reversal within their hearts, and minds, an inward turning toward hope, toward that vision for peace. The prophet at one point seems to be teetering between hope and despair as they say, what shall I cry? Surely all people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. And then there's that spark of hope that comes in. The word of the Lord will stand forever. When all seems lost, there is just that little spark, that moment of turning towards a promise for peace. And the reversal of heart seems to be the first step in moving towards restoration. The preparation begins with the will, the courage, and the defiant hope to turn from the pain and brokenness towards the opportunity for wholeness. Today, we lit a candle for peace. 
in a world that is so very far from the wholeness and goodness encompassed by that Hebrew word for peace, shalom. Lighting that candle may seem like an act of hopeless optimism or ignorant naivete. It is not. It is an act of defiance. Defiance against all the suffering in the world. It is an act that sees the hardship, suffering, pain, and brokenness of our world and dares to hope that the vision in our hearts of true peace is a reality that is even now, even now, coming into being. Years ago, I read uh, the book Pastrix by Nadia Bowles Weber, and she speaks of an opportunity she had to sing hymns in a pub. It was something they did weekly. It was after one of the mass shootings we've experienced in recent years that they happened to gather for their weekly hymn sing. But they didn't feel like singing. Slowly, as they began tentatively at first to sing those hymns, the familiar words became new. In the face of such brokenness and mourning, the words of the hymns took on new life and they sang louder and louder as if crying out against the darkness. We will not submit to this. Peace is possible. Our gospel reading this morning invokes this passage from Isaiah. You may have noticed those same words in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. They introduce John the Baptist, and in Mark's gospel, John is cast as that voice, the voice that's crying out to prepare the way. While Isaiah proclaimed a particular hope to a particular people at the time of its writing, the gospel writers frame the new hope that they are experiencing in Christ within the context of the story of their people. The scripture of Isaiah helps them to make sense of the new of what the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ means. And for them, Christ brings that same defiant promise of hope in the face of all the oppression and violence of the world, the oppression they still experience at the time of Jesus, though under a new empire. They proclaim that even now, God is making all things new. John is also calling the pe people to a reversal. John's reversal is a different Hebrew word, the word translated repent. And it is key for preparing for the kingdom of God. Just like that word comfort, John literally tells the people to turn from the way they are walking and walk a new way. In this case, he calls the people from, to turn from their sin, from all that causes brokenness and impedes the path of shalom or wholeness. That candle we lit this morning for peace does not celebrate that we have peace. It does not ignore the profound lack of peace we have, but that little flame represents a turning, a turning from despair to hope, a turning from paralyzing cynicism to trust that God is at work, even here and even now. It would be easy to 
lose ourselves in the horror of the things we are seeing and hearing in the news and the difficulties we face personally as well. And in order to experience that reversal of heart and mind, we cannot ignore those things. We start by acknowledging them. But we are called not to get stuck there. The turning of our hearts towards hope empowers us to work with God for the restoration of all people and all creation. And that's where John the Baptizer's proclamation comes in. Today, we affirm our belief that God cares about the suffering of humanity and is at work bringing full reconciliation, justice, peace, and wholeness to all creation. And that we, all of us, are a part of that holy work. On our own, we cannot undo the damage that human beings have wrought in the world. But God invites us to be part of restoration and reconciliation. And just as we can't ignore the injustice and the suffering in the world in order to truly turn towards the promise of peace, we also cannot ignore our own part in damaging that peace as we seek to turn toward wholeness for ourselves and the world. And so what starts as a glimmer of hope empowers us to have a change of heart, which in turn empowers us to make a change in our actions. Each reversal turning us nearer and nearer toward our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Now, in light of all the suffering in the world, these turnings are not easy, and I don't mean for them to be taken lightly. Oh, just change your mind. Everything's going to be okay. The text from Isaiah certainly does not mean it lightly either. Neither did the gospel writers. Some days it takes everything I have to be able to trust that God is bringing us towards wholeness. And as I worked this week, I kept having images come to my mind of specifically the suffering in Israel and Palestine, perhaps because we are reading about the same region of the world in Isaiah. I thought of everyday Palestinians, everyday Israelis, living through a painful time that I cannot even imagine. I imagine that for them, the idea of a promise of hope seems far too far away, too much in the distance, and there are probably many who have no hope over there. We are called to be that hope when we can, and to bear that hope and to share what we can of that hope with them. For them and for all who suffer on this earth. So now I leave this with you. How will we, in the here and now, prepare the way of the Lord? How will we cultivate our own hearts for peace when it seems like a dream that is so far off? How will we turn our hands to work for peace? And how will we be that beacon of hope, the ones who bear hope to the hopeless? Friends, we do so by the grace of God so I invite you all to pray with me now. God of peace, it is beyond all our understanding to envision true peace for our world, a vision that has never yet been true for our world. And so we pray today that you would place that vision in our hearts 
that you would stir our, within ourselves a turning towards hope and so empower us to be your ambassadors for peace. Place opportunities in our path to prepare the way for the coming of your kingdom, which is surely coming and is even now here. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, as you are sent into the world, I encourage you to look in your bulletin for uh, an event called Voices for Peace, hosted by the Ahmadiyya Mosque, the Hadi Mosque. Uh, that will happen tomorrow from 2 to 4 at the Harrisburg Capitol Building in the main rotunda. Uh, and it is uh, a voice for peace, for calling for a ceasefire for Israel and Palestine, and uh, recognizing the suffering that has happened on both sides of that conflict. So I commend that to you to, for tomorrow. And now, friends, go forth in peace, and may the peace which passes all understanding keep you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank uh you. -huh.